Welcome to a whole body MRI at 1.5T video tutorial demonstrating sequence positioning and post processing. My name's Will, I'm the Deputy Superintendent MRI Radiographer at Paul Strickland Scanner Centre UK. As a centre, we've performed over 6,500 whole body MRI examinations like the one you'll see in this video. Over the next 20 minutes, I'll guide you through a comprehensive whole body MRI protocol step by step. As we go along, I'll provide a few tips and tricks. This protocol was recorded on an Avantofit scanner using software level E11C. It may be possible to run a very similar protocol using an earlier software version. For the purposes of this video, I'll assume you've positioned the patient and the coils as laid out in the written guide on the Siemens Whole Body MRI website. Remember that patient comfort is key during this scan. I'll briefly cover the differences between the core and comprehensive METRADS protocols later in the video, but you can expect this comprehensive protocol to take around 45 minutes to fully acquire. Before we start, we need to make sure that our UI settings are correct. Make sure that TIM Planning UI is switched on, Auto Coil Select is switched on, and using right click in one of the scanning windows, we need to make sure that Couple Graphics is on because we'll make use of that later on. We can now start the scan, so let's see how to position this protocol. If you're using a TIMCT technique, the table will begin to move at this point, and you can see the image being generated in the top right. It's important to note that once this sequence is complete, we can plan up the spine sequences, but we should stop before we go any further. The reason for this is that the anterior coils will not display properly until the fast view localizer has fully completed. After the localizer, the scanner will continue to perform TIM CT adjustments. Once the images have reconstructed, we can begin planning the spine sequences. First of all, we're adjusting the position to ensure sufficient head to foot coverage and then we page through the images and change the angle of the slice groups to ensure sufficient right to left coverage. Note that the use of coupled graphics streamlines this process. Once we're satisfied with the coverage we can apply the position which will copy to the T1 sequence below. You can open that to check the positioning has copied correctly. If you're using a set and go technique with composing enabled, the top and bottom stations should stitch themselves automatically. The TIM CT adjustments are now complete, so the scanner table will move to the position for the first spine sequence. As soon as the first spine sequence begins, we can open the T1 Dixon TIM CT sequence and adjust its positioning. The yellow arrow is indicating the blue isocenter line, which needs to lie just inside the patient's skull. We adjust right to left coverage using the humoral heads as a guide. You may wish to extend the range of this sequence for taller patients. Next we'll position the diffusion sequences. It's important that these extend from the vertex to at least mid-thigh. As you'll see, there are four individual slice groups which move together with coupled graphics on. In this particular case, very small adjustments are needed to ensure correct head to foot and right to left coverage, but for some patients it may be necessary to adjust A to P position as well. Before applying your settings, ensure that the B01 element is activated for the first slice group. We've noticed that this reduces the sudden change in contrast between the first and second slice groups. Next up is the T1 coronal sequences, and we'll position these in a similar way, ensuring head to foot coverage, right to left coverage using the humeral heads as a guide, and our A to P coverage can be adjusted by changing the number of slices per slab, but be aware if you're using a breath hold technique this will increase the length of the breath holds. 
At this point, we'll take the opportunity to check that the T2 haste sequence has copied correctly from the T1 Dixon Tim CT sequence. Note that it's not necessary for the blue isocenter line to lie inside the patient's skull for this sequence. Once we've checked that sequence, positioning is complete. We can remove any notes that we no longer need. I'll occasionally skip through the acquisition of sequences, but I'll leave time before the next one begins so you can pause if necessary. Before we go any further, I'll pause the video for a moment to briefly discuss the differences between this comprehensive protocol and a core protocol. As previously mentioned, we're performing this scan as a METRADS compliant comprehensive protocol. To transform this into a core protocol, simply remove the B600 from your diffusion sequences and remove the T1 coronal Dixon and T2 haste axial from the protocol entirely. For more information on this, please visit the Siemens whole body MRI website. But for now, let's return to the scan. The quieter gaps between sequences is a great time to get in touch with your patient and find out how they're getting on. If your patients aren't required to change into an entirely metal-free hospital gown or something similar, it's usually a good idea to take the opportunity now to look through your coronal localizer for any removable metal artefacts. Any such artefacts must be removed before the diffusion sequences begin, so add a pause if necessary. It's likely that you're using this protocol to scan oncology patients, so it's important to be vigilant for any emergency findings. Here, I'm scrolling through the spine images looking for any spinal cord compressions, and it's also possible to visualise lesions in the cerebellum from this sequence. For the purposes of this video tutorial, I've skipped through the other times where I've viewed the images, but as you'll see, there's plenty of time to look through your images during sequence acquisition. You may want to consider further dedicated imaging of any emergencies that you find, such as spinal cord compressions or brain lesions. As you can see, the spine images have been automatically stitched. This is a great time-saving technique, reducing the amount of post-processing required. The spinal imaging is now complete. The T1 Dixon Tim CT sequence is about to start. It's possible to perform breath hold imaging through the chest and the abdomen if the patient is able. But to begin with, we will use the scan pause button to scan continuously until we can see the start of the patient's shoulders. Ensuring that the button with the yellow arrow is depressed will give you a coronal localizer as you proceed through this scan. When performing breath holds, it may be easier for your patient to hold their breath on inspiration. If so, instruct them to take the same amount of breath each time. Clicking the scan pause button again will allow you to pause the sequence at the point you wish to begin the breath holds. Using the scan breath hold button, we perform a fixed length breath hold with the patient and advise them to breathe normally once the breath hold has completed. This can be repeated after a short break for the patient and we can repeat the process as many times as is required to scan through the chest and the abdomen. If you don't have access to the TIM CT feature, you may want to consider running a sequence which features several slice groups covering the range that you wish to image. Setting the slice groups to match those in the diffusion sequence is optimal in this case. Once we've completed the final breath hold with the patient, we can use the scan pause button to resume continuous scanning for the rest of the sequence.
we're now ready to begin the diffusion sequences. Whole body diffusion imaging is subject to the broken spine artifact, which manifests itself as a sudden step in the spinal cord where two slice groups join. This artifact can be reduced or eliminated entirely by using the eye shim or slice adjust feature, but as this may not be available, this protocol uses a center frequency fixing technique. Once the adjustments have completed, you'll be presented with this dialog box. What you have to do here is copy the frequency that has been set by the scanner for this station and hit the continue button. You'll apply that frequency to the subsequent stations when their dialog boxes pop up later on. You can set this as an image comment for safekeeping if necessary. The first diffusion sequence has completed, so we'll now wait for the dialog box to pop up again where we can apply our center frequency. I'm intentionally not cutting these adjustments from the video. This is to give you some idea of how long you might need to wait before the next confirmed frequency adjustment box appears. Now the dialog box has appeared, it's a simple case of pasting the center frequency and applying it before continuing. Don't be concerned by the error which has appeared in the lower bar. In this case the error has appeared because we've asked the scanner to provide the confirmed frequency dialog before sequence acquisition. For this tutorial I've removed the video of the acquisition of the remaining two slice groups, but the process is the same. Depending on how you've set your protocol up, the scanner may now perform some automated breath holds with the patient. I've skipped through the recording of these as there's very little interaction required, and so we proceed to the T2 haste imaging where you can see a coronal localizer is being produced during the sequence acquisition. It's possible to perform breath holds during this sequence if required. Once the T2 Hay sequence has finished, that's it, the protocol's complete, and we can now move on to the post-processing steps required for radiologist reading. The post-processing for this protocol comes in two parts. The first is calculation of fat fraction images, and the second is the use of your high B-value images that you've just acquired to produce some radial MIPS and some coronal MPRs. So we'll start with the fat fraction images. First of all, you want to select your T1, Dixon, TIMCT, fat and water images. And using the evaluation tool as shown, you're going to add these two series together. It's not necessary to change anything on this dialog, so you can just click OK. Once those images have been produced, you have a new series called Add. And we're going to take the Add and the Fat images and perform an evaluation on those using the Divide function. It's important that the add is in the divide by section, so click the exchange button to achieve this. And then we want to adjust the scaling, which improves the dynamic range available to the radiologists when they're reading the images. All we need to do is change the factor from 1 to 1000 and click OK. 
and then we're going to change the name of the series to something straightforward like T1 weighted fat percent. Next up is the use of the high B value images, in this case the B900 images, to produce some radial MIPS and coronal MPRs. Note that there are two separate combos here, one is an ADC, which you don't want to use, and the other is the diffusion images which you do want to use. It is possible to manually create these combo series, but in this case we've used a set and go technique and asked the scanner to perform an automatic compose using the diffusion function. Unfortunately at the moment it's not possible to ask the scanner to label each combo as DWI or ADC correctly. You should find that the images display in B value order if you use the sort function to achieve this. Select the first image which should be your first high B value image and hold shift and click the last in the high B value set. The arrows are pointing to a change in slice position which is an easy way to spot when you've got the last image that you need. Load these images to a cleared viewing window and make sure you've got the correct images by checking in the bottom left hand corner. Using right click, select the series and then save the new series using patient save as and use a descriptor which will be easy to find later on. You're looking for about 215 images in this set if that's any different, it may be that you've selected them incorrectly, so just go back and check. Some images may be discarded in the composing process, so don't worry if it's just one or two off. We now want to load our new series into the 3D tool. The following post-processing has been performed without inverting the images, but you may want to ask your radiologist if they require this at this stage. First of all we want to generate the coronal MPRs. In this case I'm using a preset which was saved previously. But the idea is that you're covering the patient from front to back with as many slices as is required. Ensuring the button indicated with the arrow is not depressed will prevent the slice gap from increasing as you drag the range out. Once you've generated them, save them and we'll now move on to the radial MIP images. And again, we'll use a preset, but essentially you're looking for images every three degrees, which should give you 120 images. You can center the range over the front of the visible vertebral body. And once they're generated, you save them in the same way as the Corona MPRs. It's worth noting that within the METRAD standard, use of an inverted grayscale is highly recommended. You can either make this change at this point. Alternatively, the radiologist can make the change when reading. You can visit the links on screen now for more information about METRADS. But that's it for this scan, the post-processing is now complete. I hope this tutorial has been helpful. Hopefully, after you've run this protocol a few times, you should find the process fairly straightforward. But please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. For further information, please visit www.siemens.com forward slash WB MRI. On the website, you'll find a written how to guide, along with several articles and case studies describing the use of protocols like the one we've just run when performing METRAD's core and comprehensive scans. Thanks very much for watching.